this day of 2024. We are in court number 11 in the Deben Magistrates Court. Matter appears before Mr. V. Isaac Dryer for the state is uh, Advocate Gaba and Advocate Gregor. Representing I choose number one or applicant number one and five is Advocate um, Mlochwa. Representing I choose or applicant number two is Advocate Volmarans. Representing I choose or applicant number three is Miss Gilling. Representing or, or uh, representing I choose or applicant number four is Advocate Jorgensen. Ms. Lamini is assisting with the interpretation of this matter. Matter was adjourned today for purposes of parties to make uh, submissions in relation to the application to be released on bail brought by all five accused or applicants. Thank you. You confirm your appearance. May it please the court to wish I do confirm my appearance on behalf of applicant number one and number five in these bail applications. Thank you. Uh, please the court to wish I confirm my appearance on behalf of applicant number two. Good, please, as you worship on behalf of applicant three, confirm my appearance. May it please the court to wish I appear for number four, Jorgensen P, instructed by Mr. Taylor. Uh, I need to place on record that uh, we are only starting at this time because of the delay which was occasioned by yourselves, in that your papers were not correct, and uh, I had to allow you opportunity to rectify your papers, which has caused a delay, and uh, fortunately now the papers are all ready and corrected. I must also place on record that uh, the heads of argument by the state were only sent late yesterday. According to my computer, they were sent at half past two, at which time there was no internet i could not access them so i don't know what is contained in the state's papers i could not read because this morning i had to drive from where i'm coming from to here and had to attend to the shortcomings that were there in your papers but be that as it may i will allow you to proceed with uh, your submissions and engage you wherever I can uh, in uh, your submissions. Whilst we are proceeding with uh, the arguments, the applicants may be seated. I will give the floor to you Advocate Mlodja. Uh, yes, first and foremost, in respect of the introductory remarks by the court, the responsibility is, is being owned for the mistakes that the court had to give us the <coughs> indulgence. We are indebted to the court for the indulgence. You worship, the argument by all parties in the matter is to the effect that, in the light of the fact that we are dealing with multiple applicants that there will be no need to read the entire heads of argument to save time. However, one will have to draw the attention of the court to those aspects one feels are significant to be brought to the attention of the court. <clears throat> Your Worship, I'm not sure if perhaps it will, be, it will not be more appropriate to mark all the heads of argument, or they will be marked as we are proceeding? They, they will be marked as we are proceeding, but yours are creating a problem in that uh, you have combined the first and the fifth applicants. Uh, that is correct, Your Worship. Yes, in, in, in one document. Uh, 
which would mean that uh, I will have to mark them as exhibit, as one exhibit. That is the position you should uh, for convenience sake. So for applicant number one and applicant number five, the heads of argument will be marked exhibit N. As court pleases. Thank you. You may proceed. <coughs> Your Worship, I will shoot straight to paragraph three of my heads of argument. As the court has indicated that the state's heads of argument were submitted yesterday, it would appear that after traversing the state's heads of argument, one has to see some authorities to clarify further issues. So under paragraph three, Your Worship, if the following can be added, that the Criminal Procedure Act 51 of 1977 does not contain a legal definition of bail, save to mention in section 68 that the effect of bail granted. Sorry, Councillor, where, where are you reading? Or where should that be added? Your Worship, it will be added under paragraph three. Paragraph three starts by. It before, is this... before paragraph four. Paragraph 3 reads, it is respectfully submitted that the learned authors to do it at all opine that the basic purpose of bail from society's point of view has always been and still is to ensure the accused reappearance for trial, but pre-trial release serves other purposes as well. Purposes recognized over the last decade as often dispositive of the fairness of the entire criminal proceedings. Pre-trial release allows a man accused of crime to keep the fabric of his life intact, to maintain employment and family ties in the event he is acquitted or given a suspended sentence or probation. It spares his family the hardship and indignity of welfare and enforced separation. It permits the accused to take an active part in planning his defense with his counsel, locating witnesses, proving his capability of staying free in the community without getting into trouble. So having read the heads of the, of the state, Your Worship, I'm of the opinion that it will be important to add the following, that the Criminal Procedure Act 51 of 97 itself does not contain a legal definition of bail, save to mention in Section 68 that the effect of bail granted is that an accused person shall be released from custody upon payment or the furnishing of a guarantee to pay the sum of money determined for bail. In essence, the purpose of bail can be regarded as securing the attendance of the accused while balancing the interests of justice against various rights and factors. <clears throat> Again, Your Worship, under paragraph four, before paragraph five, the, I found it uh, important that uh, a reference be made uh, in the case of, uh, in, re in relation to the case of Novik versus Minister of Law, and order, and another, 1993, Volume 1, SACR 194, Vet Vates Run Local Division decision, as it was known then, judgment by Berman A.J. on page 197, particularly paragraph F to I, where the learned judge stated that the state is not entitled to hold an accused in custody for the purpose of investigations and so frustrate his right to apply for bail. The state in that context, the relevant policeman, is not entitled to be the final arbiter, arbiter as to whether an accused is entitled to bail or not. The case that I quoted in paragraph five, Your Worship, is a well-known case of Goddard versus the state, wherein the accused was facing multiple multiple charges of rape in this decision, in this division, with complainants who were all primary school learners, where the learned judge in this division, Mungadi, stated that incarceration prior to a conviction with all its irreversible indignities and consequences may not be resorted to easily in a constitutional democracy with enshrined bill of rights. Otherwise, your worship, this other case finds relevance. Uh, State versus Smith and another, 1969, volume four, SA, 175, decision of this division, N, at 177 page, paragraph E to F, where it was held as follows. The general principles governing the grant of bail are that 
In exercising the statutory decision conferred upon it, the court must be governed by the foundational principle which is to uphold the interest of justice. The court will always grant bail where possible and will lean in favor of and not against the liberty of the subject, provided that it is, not, uh, it is clear that the interest of justice will not be, 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 be prejudiced. Your Worship, I think it is important to jump to the additional reasons why bail should be granted. That will appear on page seven of my heads of argument. Your Worship, it's common cause that before this honorable court are the founding affidavits by both the, the first applicant and the second applicant in paragraphs 212, 213, 214, where there, is, there are reasons given for why bail should be granted. After receiving the state papers and going through the state papers, Your Worship, particularly the paragraphs in the opposing affidavits, affidavit of the state 212, 213, 214, and the heads of argument that the state has submitted, Your Worship, there is no denial that the possibility exists that before the matter can be set down for trial, uh, the other processes will have to come full cycle, the extradition as well as the mutual legal assistance. Your Worship, it is in that context that paragraph 14 is stated that, it is stated that in full compliance with brevity is the soul of the wit. We are talking about the inference that one is able to draw. So it is another reason that um, the bail application ought to be granted, especially because even if the court outside this jurisdiction, the requested country, that is Eswatini, even if it grants the order to surrender, those alleged fugitives will still be entitled to, <clears throat> to, 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 to appeal. Your Worship, the allegation in paragraph 18, the, the allegation that the, the applicants will not stand trial, Your Worship, the, it ought to be the allocation by the state ought to be considered in the context that in respect of applicant number one, he became aware in December 2023 when he alleges that upon his arrest, arrest it was brought to his attention that the police will eventually arrest him in connection with the death of the deceased number one in this, in this, in this matter. So up until he was arrested, he was arrested in his, in his, at the police station, complying fully with the, with the, with the order of the learned magistrate, uh, Mr. Singh. Your Worship, this allegation but not... How, sorry, how can you say he was complying fully with the order of uh, magistrate Singh when the evidence is that uh, he was looked for at his residence, he could not be found, that is why he had to be arrested at the police station and later he took the police to Nzeleni where some of his belongings were found. Your Worship, I, 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 I fully understand the, the court's concern. However, my humble submission, Your Worship, to the court's concern is that the concern also arises in the evidence of the investigating officer to that effect. If one looks at the affidavit that was filed, presented before the learned magistrate, Mr. Singh, the investigating officer was able to interview the parents of applicant number one, the mother, the father, as well as the siblings, for him to say personal circumstances have been verified. This time around, Your Worship, the concern is the investigating officer is making that allegation without taking the court into full confidence. Who exactly did he speak to? Who would have given that information to him? If in the initial bail application he's able to interrogate and interview the parents, what is it that would have prevented him this time around not to do that? So my humble submission, Your Worship, is that the evidence of the, of the applicant ought to be accepted in that regard. And again, Your Worship, the legalities, the constitutionality of the issue, of the explanation, no explanation of rights, no indication to applicant number one, whatever he says, may be used against him at a subsequent uh, uh, court proceedings. I think, Your Worship, that is also a concern. My humble submission is, had the investigating officer approached his parent, his parents, his parents would have confirmed the police station, would, oh, the register was not even challenged that he was signing at the police station, that he was complying fully with the order of the learned magistrate.
But uh, yeah, I, I, I hear you in saying that uh, there was maybe constitutional issues, explanation of his rights and what have you. Now the question that comes to mind is, how would the uh, investigating officer have known of Enzelini address had the accused not supplied that address? Yes, that is the allegation we make in the, in the, in the replying affidavit, the reliance upon the informers. It's possibly that somebody purported him to be an informer would have tendered that evidence to the investigating officer. It is against that background, Your Worship, that had the investigating officer at least obtained the statements to which people he got the information that he was no longer residing in the area were stating when they got that information and what circumstances and so on and so forth. And Your Worship, the standard in these proceedings is just on an honors, it is just on the balance of probabilities. We'll Your Worship, in respect of paragraph 19, uh, I think paragraph 19 of my heads of argument ought to be looked at in conjunction with paragraph 36 of the state's uh, uh, heads of argument. Starting with the state's heads of argument, in paragraph 36, reference is made to the case of State versus Kitikat. I assume, Your Worship, all of us has, 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 has cited that uh, case as it is locus classicus from the, from the Apex, court, Ap Ap Apex Court. What I'm trying to throw to the attention of the court, Your Worship, is that the state is saying the court held that bail proceedings are sui generis. I fully agree. The, the application may be brought soon after arrest. Your Worship, my humble submission in that regard is that this case is distinguishable from the Skitekat case in the sense that the alleged incident date back to February. There is a huge time lapse between the arrest or upon all the applicants and the alleged incident. And if the state is saying the investigations are incomplete, Your Worship, again, there, there is concern in the sense that the state is just generic. The state is not taking this court into full confidence in terms of particularizing in the light of the time lapse between the alleged incident and the date of arrest. What is it that is still outstanding? Is it the money laundering charge? Is it the assessment and the analysis of the forensic evidential material? That is not coming from the state except that this, the investigations are incomplete. It is in that, uh, on that basis where should that reference is made to the case of Moi in paragraph 19, where the learned judge Sneders, J.A., held that the delay by the state in concluding its case taken with the accused weaknesses of state case constitute exceptional circumstances which in the interest of justice permit the release uh, of, the, of, the, of the accused. In other words, Your Worship, it cannot be an excuse. This is a high profile matter. It cannot be excused that after, after more than 12 months of the alleged incident when the arrest is executed upon the people considered to be connected with the matter. There is a wild allegation without particularizing the investigation. Let me understand you again. Are you saying it is the state submission that the investigation has not been finalized? Outstanding? Yes. Yoshi, probably it will be wise to refer to paragraph 266 of uh, the answering affidavit by the investigating officer, Mr. Pillay, wherein he states as follows. The investigations in this matter are at an advanced stage and very strong against the applicant. My team and I took a long time to investigate this matter prior to arresting the applicants in order not to delay the matter further after arrest. This approach has yielded the results because the investigations are advanced. In a nutshell, your worship, it is clear, and again in the heads of argument by the state, it is clear that even if the judgment were to be handed down in this matter, the matter will not be set down for trial immediately, as there are still investigations that are ongoing. Well, the, 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 but does this say there is outstanding investigation? The, the investigation are in an adv advanced state. Yes, Your Worship. Okay. What does that say? Investigations are incomplete. Yeah, okay. 
my instructions, my ship is, it just says that, as the court has correctly pointed out, investigations are at an advanced stage, but it doesn't say the investigations have, full, have come full sight, are complete. Well, we, we, uh, th th this, this makes one speculate. Could it not be not finalized because there are accused who are still outstanding? who are still to be extradited from Aswatin. I'm not here for the state, but I'm just asking because uh, uh, that is a fact. As the court, your presumption is everybody is able to articulate himself. If that was the position, Mr. Pillay, the investigating officer, would have stated exactly in those, in those, in those clear terms. That it goes back to the concern that I've raised, the generic allegations. Yes, you, 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 that you, you, it, it would have helped all of us if the state was able to take everybody into full confidence and tabulate this is X, Y, Z that is outstanding. For instance, if there is an allegation of a money laundering, probably one would think of a forensic audit report. Somebody would expect perhaps the, the DNA to be outstanding. So under normal circumstances, it is the practice in our bail applications, Your Worship where the state will take the court into full confidence and say investigations are at an advanced stage, however outstanding is the following. It doesn't help to just generically refer to the investigations as just as being at an advanced stage. Uh, 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 whilst we are on that, you are saying, citing uh, Moy versus the state in page 10, yes. that uh, Snyder uh, J.A. held in Moy that uh, the, the delay by the state in concluding its case, taken with deduced weaknesses of the state case, constitute exceptional circumstances. What, what, what do you mean, weaknesses? Your uh, Worship, as I, I, I progress with, the, with my submissions, at a later stage I will be demonstrating to this court the impeachability of the charges that the state has preferred against the, the accused when we talk about the state case. Obviously, with the Moy case, as well as this honorable court, we'll have to adopt a holistic, expansive, uh, 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 integrative approach, looking at all the aspects. And then in the context of Scott, Scott Crossley, individually and cumulatively, make a determination whether exceptional circumstances are, 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 have been presented or not. Well, I'm asking this question at this point in time because in your founding affidavit, you say that uh, the, 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 the applicant number one will apply for discharge in terms of section 174 of the criminal procedure during the trial. It is on those bases that I'm raising this question. Not only that, Your Worship, a, a, an affirmation to the effect that the state is clashing at straws in the, in the affidavit. Probably, Your Worship, let me quickly address the court under the state case subject to serious doubt and non-existent in paragraph 28 of my heads of argument. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> yes. Okay, my apologies. Your Worship, if one were to understand the attack on the state charges, if one looks at the state heads of argument, paragraph 61, The state submits as follows. On the charges of unlawful possession of firearms and joint possession principle, the High Court of this division has recently pronounced on same and convicted the accused on those charges based on the principles as indicated on Exhibit G. That being the case, Your Worship, at the back of our minds, we have got how the attack is, is crafted in the founding affidavit and the heads of argument. First of all, the issue of duplication of the charges, the splitting of the charges, 
in respect of the first two counts, uh, conspiracy to commit murder and murder. I, I pause there. Your Worship, the greatest advantage we have is that this honorable court has been sitting in the court of first instance for years. Invariably would have served the indictments on the accused who would have been transferred from the court of the, of the first instance to the high court in terms of section 75, subsection two. That being the case, this court would have observed the practice in the division of making those two counts, <coughs> the main and the alternative count, not separate counts. So if you look at the two de decisions that the state has submitted, state versus Dabash, two accused were involved before the honorable acting judge, Sajwayo. My learned colleague for the state, Mr. Gwega, was prosecuting conspiracy to commit murder, murder, and then unlawful possession of firearm based on joint possession doctrine. The learned judge granted 174 in respect of accused number two. And if you look, that will be in paragraph 17 of Kabash. So which means the matter proceeded beyond state's case in respect of accused number one. Those two counts, and then at the end of the, at the, end of the day, the learned judge, Shachwayo, convicted on murder and possession of firearm and ammunition. Interesting in that case, the learned judge, Mr. Shachwayo, stated that there was, the state, my learned colleague, Mr. Kweger, was able to present evidence beyond reasonable doubt that accused number one, that would be Mr. Kabash, is the one who was in physical possession of the firearm. However, the state failed to prove the second leg. So that submission, Your Worship, it, 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 it addresses the conspiracy to commit murder and murder, as well as the issue of the joint possession of firearms. Your Worship, it is on that basis that in paragraph 30, a history has been given tracing the principle on the splitting in respect of those two counts. Paragraph 30 of my heads of argument. It is <coughs> particularly paragraph 30.1 where I state the following. The diachronic approach makes it clear as a day that archaic is sacrosanct criminal law principle of splitting or duplication of charges. Accordingly, <coughs> conspiracy to commit murder and murder, count numbers one and two, constitute splitting or duplication of charges in this matter. The learned author C.R. Sneiman in Criminal Law Textbook defines conspiracy as an inchoate, formally defined crime, whereas murder is a complete, materially defined crime. Hence, more often than not, the rule of practice is that the former is an alternative to the latter. 30.2, however, the criminal law principle of splitting or duplication of charges, particularly in respect of conspiracy to commit murder and murder, has long been enunciated and put to rest by the Supreme Court of Appeal first in R versus Min and Ailey, uh, then State versus Fraser, and most recently in State versus Nongoko versus the State, in bracket, that would be in footnote number 31, the full citation, open bracket 852 slash 2020, close bracket, open bracket 2021, ZASCA 166, paragraph three. The application for leave to appeal was granted against conviction and sentence on conspiracy to commit murder and murder by Mchali in Nongoma, in Nongongo. This case, your worship, it emanates from Umtata. And then on appeal, Nicole's J.A., Wilson Daka, A.J.P., and Mochumi and Mokotwa and Govan, J.J.A., in the Supreme Court of Appeal concurred that the state had correctly considered that the applicant should have been convicted of either murder or conspiracy to commit murder, but not both. This is the constitution of the SCA. This was explained in State versus Fraser. Normally, where a person conspires with another to commit a crime, and the crime in question is committed, then the conspirator is liable for the crime itself and should be so charged. A reference is made to Puchel. Then the charge is continued. This concession is well made, and therefore, the appeal on duplication must succeed. And your worship, the second case of Lopes, which I think is the most recent one, my learned colleague Zaba and Gwega again were, prosecuted, were prosecuting. Uh, in the case of Lopes, your worship, it would appear that he convicted. He convicted on conspiracy to commit murder and murder, 
and convicted on joint possession, unlawful possession of a firearm and firearm. But my submission, Your Worship, is those, no, those two are now contradiction, contradictions. Sajwayo saying no, agreeing with the Supreme Court of Appeal, lobes convicting. My humble submission is that we go back to the basic principle of starting the cases, that we stand by the non court decision to say at least the state does not have those two charges. There's doubt in respect of those two charges, conspiracy to commit murder and murder. The same with the joint possession of firearms. I have enunciated the principle, including the Makubela decision. <coughs> if you look at the Kabasha decision where my learned colleague Dwega was, was, was prosecuting, understandably stemming from state versus Gosi, state versus Mbuli, with regard in a number of cases, including the Makeleni decision that I've cited, Your Worship. My humble submission is the principle has always been there must be proof which one had a physical possession of the firearm and then a number of facts from which the trial court should infer. The one who had a firearm physically held it on behalf of the other accused. If you look at the Kabasha decision that the state has, has, has submitted, we are humbly submitting your worship that the applicants have succeeded in demonstrating the, 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 the how doubtful the, 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 ex the existence of the two charges will, will continue during the trial proceedings. The same with the joint possession, Your Worship. Your Worship, the other, I, I won't go further, Your Worship, in respect of the, of the joint possession. I've explained it in paragraph 30.5 in the interest of time. I was just explaining the principles, except that. Um, including the most recent decision of the of the of the of the Makelin. Yoship, then another aspect that I think the applicants have succeeded in doing. They've shown the doubt, conspiracy to commit murder and murder. They, they've shown the doubt in respect of the of the unlawful possession of firearms, ammunition and uh, and um, and uh, and a firearm. Uh, relying on the Kabasha decision and relying on the cases that I've, 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 I've submitted here in court, which does not necessarily require the presentation of the evidence. And then the, the, the interesting one, Your Worship, is the issue of the 803,000 rand deposited, which becomes the subject matter of the level of count numbers 11 and 12, i.e. the money laundering charges. Your Worship, with regard to that charge, my humble submission is, both in the state founding affidavit as well as in the heads of argument, there is no dispute, there is no serious material dispute how the applicants are demonstrating that for those charges to stand the test of time during the trial, required will be the three points, the ABC point. And the most difficult part, Your Worship, is with the A point in this matter, this court can't make any negative or adverse finding against the A point, the deposit. Is it blue cycle entity that deposited 803,000 rand into accused number, uh, accused number four's counts? The reason, Your Worship, maybe if I may read this paragraph in its entirety, 30.6, there is no dispute in respect of A, B, and C points averred as a vehicle or mechanism through which money laundering is determined by first applicant in his founding affidavit in that to constitute the offense of money laundering. There ought to be point A as the original point of departure for the money, but requiring point B as a laundering washing or cleaning up point so that it reaches the destination point, point C, supposed to be C, appearing as innocent money. Gravely concerning is that the bank statements presented by fourth applicant and a letter on court record by the Gabba brothers that there are other payments made by the same entity into the bank account of the fourth applicant. But through the cherry picking approach, the focus has been uh, the focus of and by the investigating officer was only on 803,000 rand. This has an effect of creating a smoke screen around the normal legitimate deposit. At any rate, the law requires this honorable court not to make any adverse finding against the deposit, that is the blue circle entity. 
the making of adverse finding against the person not party to the proceedings. According to Hams DP in National Director of Pipe Prosecutions versus Zuma, open brackets in footnote number 37573-08, close bracket, open bracket 2009, close bracket, ZACA, paragraph 1, paragraph 13, <coughs> handed down on 12 January 2009. Uh, it amounts to changing the rules of the game as it takes the eyes off the ball with the effect of red carding not only players but also the spectators. I accept and I respect that you are not representing applicant number, five, number four, but how do we explain the fact that uh, applicant number four in his papers does not attach the bank statement showing the transaction of uh, the 800,000 uh, deposit? And even when it is brought to his attention or to his legal representative attention, that uh, that part of the statement is lacking and is not part of uh, the statement, he refuses. I say refuses because it was brought more than once to the attention of the council and up to this date, that portion of the statement has not been uh, 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 brought before court. I fully agree with the court that if one were to look at that in vacuum, it concerns. But if one looks at it in the context of the fact that there is also a letter that is now in the public domain, confirm even in the bank statements that are before this court that other than these deposits, it would appear that the, that evidence has not been disputed. Yeah, but uh, is applicant number four playing open cards if he submits a bank statement, but this bank statement purposely omit the dates on which the 800,000 was, was deposited? Uh, I, I take it that my learned colleague, Mr. Chokensino, addressed the court uh, on that aspect. Safe to say that in the light of the fact that the, land, the money laundering charge is also faced by the other applicants, particularly one and five, the only submission I can make is that if one were to look at it in vacuum, it is a problem. But the moment the information comes to the fore that it's not only the deposit, in that account, it neutralizes everything. This was only, by the way, you are not in any event representing applicant number four, but you mentioned applicant number four's name, and that is why I'm raising this. This is the question that is going to be raised when the, uh, the heads on behalf of applicant number four are presented, uh, 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 made. But you have, you have referred to applicant number four, and that is why I'm raising this. There is a concern, and that concern has not been addressed. Even I had to say to Mr. Gwega, Mr. Gwega, you cannot force applicant number four to supplement his papers if he's not prepared to do that. What is that? Uh, as the court pleases, to the extent that uh, money laundering is also, uh, be, has also been preferred against the other applicants, particularly one in five, the only submission I make, Your Worship, is that it gets neutralized if the information comes to the fore, which is also in the public domain, that it's not, it's not only the deposit in account number four, there are other accounts. So which means those accounts, Your Worship, if there was a, a serious challenge of wanting to charge with money laundering, they ought to have been brought to the attention of the okay, court. Again, as well. Mr. Mlojo, you are not representing applicant number four. If you speak of other accounts, which other accounts are you talking about? Your Worship, may I leave the point for my colleague uh, yes. on that aspect? I think yes. Better leave it for, 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 for Mr. Jorgensen because there are no other accounts that were submitted, and the, even the only account that we know of is, is, is wanting, to say the least. But, Your Worship, the legal principle involved is that no negative adverse inference can be drawn against somebody who is not the... the question may be raised. Yes. I fully agree with the court. I fully agree with the court. Your Worship, uh, the other aspects, I think both parties have, uh, have uh, made submissions regarding the, the DPP's, um, the DPP's uh, affidavit. Your Worship, with the DPP's affidavit, the way I've understood it, my learned colleagues for the state, their grave concern is non-compliance with Section 235 as well as the reason why it came about. In other words, why the director of this division had to depose to an affidavit. Your Worship, I cannot take the matter further other than stating that those points, the eight points that I raised, 
uh, the, the eight points that are in the affidavit of accused number, accused number one and um, accused number five become relevant. With one addition, Your Worship, Your Worship, with one addition, when one looks at uh, the principles of evidence, that would be Schwickert and Van der Merwe on page 441, where the Leonard authors are saying the following. The topic is the Electronic Communications and Transactions Act, 25 of 2002, the ECT Act. The two Leonard authors, I will quote just two paragraphs. The ECT Act moves beyond the concept of computer printouts and focuses on the term data and data messages. The Act defines data as electronic representation of information in any form. And then the second one is relevant here. The data message is as data generated, sent, received, or stored by electronic means and includes the voice where the voice is used in an automated transactions. So, Your Worship, which means the only additional submission I can make is that in terms of these learned, in terms of these learned authors, it becomes a computer generated evidence by virtue of the fact that, among other things, it is not stored as a hard copy, but is stored electronically. But what, what, what is the DPP's affidavit? What was it made for? What was its purpose in submitting it in the Eswatini court? Your Worship, as I've indicated to the court, no intentions at all to regurgitate all the eight grounds, except that my only submission is those eight grounds, including the submission that I've made, quoting from the learned authors, uh, are the only submissions that I can make. Um, I humbly submit, Your Worship, that both the submissions that the state has made and the submissions that we have made, they will be able to put this court in a position where this court can make an appropriate uh, finding in that regard. But I want you to please assist me. What, what was the intention, what was the purpose of submitting an affidavit by uh, advocate uh, heresy in uh, the Eswatini court. Why did she submit that affidavit? Yes, it's common cause between the parties for provisional arrest. To show that uh, there is a case against the accused and they should be arrested. Am, am I understanding it correctly? I fully agree with the court, Your Worship. But the problem is not only the alleged fugitive in Switzerland, it also explains the evidence against the accused that are before this honorable court. To say there is a case for them to answer and they should be arrested or prosecuted. That is am, 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 I, am, I, am I understanding correctly? Yes, Worship. Yes, Worship. Okay. And you, you have pointed out variances or differences between the affidavit by uh, Advocate Harrison and uh, Warrant Officer Pillay. That is the position you issue. So, and the variances that are there, can we highlight them? I've seen two. You, you should, other than the times, yes. the issue of how evidence is presented by Pillay and the DPP. Particularly, let's look at uh, accused number one. Let me make an example with accused number one. If one looks at the, if the court may bear with me. If the court may bear with me for a second. In fact, I intend addressing the court making reference to a replying affidavit. That's the one that I'm trying to locate. We have got quite a number of voluminous documents.
As God pleases, I am indebted to the, to the court, Your Worship. Your Worship, with regard to the questions that the court has raised, uh, those will, I mean, the amendments will be from paragraph 4.16, 4.17, where, where, where are we reading now? That is the, the, the replying affidavit of the first applicant. That is now Exhibit H. That is the, that is correct, Your Worship. So you are reading from? Your Worship, I was drawing the attention of the court to paragraph 4.16 on, on page 9. Got it. Paragraph 4.16 and par paragraph 4.17, those are the differences in terms of time. Just for the record, what, what are the differences in time? Yes, but <laughs> the affidavit was 4.16. The affidavit was deposed to by the Director of Prior Prosecutions, Guazul Natal, two days prior to the execution of arrest in Eswatini. Well, I expected that you have calculated time to say that because my calculation was the difference with respect, in respect of the first one was 48 minutes and the difference in respect of the second one was 8 minutes. Yes. Did I calculate correctly? Correctly, Your Worship. And then you and that is that is the difference. That is the variances you are referring to. It's not the only variance, my Lord. No, opinion. no. But yes, that, that is the variance you are referring to. It, it is one, Your Worship. But is this court seized with differences in the in, in the witness's testimony, or is that for the trial court? Your Worship, uh, again, in that respect. It's my humble submission that uh, obviously there will be issues that this honor will court at the end of the day will indicate are for trial court. But in an attempt to discharge the honors, the accused has to present anything and everything. Hence, reference was made to Skittikat how a broad approach is, 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 is adopted. It is on that score in the sense that in the world of law, there is no catalog list fixed saying this is what the, the applicant must, 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 must present. But it, yes, uh, so, sorry to interrupt you. What is the duty of this court in the bail application? Am I understanding correctly? The question that needs to be answered by this court is, is there a case against the applicant? And if there is a case against the applicant, is there a risk if he is released on bail? Am, am I summarizing it correctly? 100% right. Will the accused stand trial yes. if bail is granted? Yes. Will the interest that, of that justice is the part of it. Will the interest of justice best be served constitutionally and in terms of the jurisprudence? It's quite a wide variety of factors that is expected from the applicants so as to help this court to arrive at a decision where the court can say, I'm satisfied the interest of justice warrant or the interest of justice does not warrant. But and this court should be wary of not usurping the powers or the duties of uh, the trial court. Yes, in fact, that is my main submission in paragraph, uh, in paragraph uh, number one, that uh, in Van Veik, obviously, uh, the court held in Van Veik, uh, 2005, Volume 1, SACR 41, SCA, Paragraph 6, that bail proceedings are not to be viewed as a full dress rehearsal for the criminal trial. I fully agree with the court, hence I have cited that case as because an introductory In, in bail remark. application, for instance, there is inadmissible evidence that is admitted, like hearsay evidence, for instance. <laughs> We, we admit hearsay evidence in bail applications, whereas in a trial court, hearsay evidence, you don't even mention hearsay evidence. Your Worship, is, I, is, I, it, I, is it not so? I, I do accept it that hearsay yes. evidence is, is admissible. So, uh, evidence that is inadmissible in a trial court 
may be admissible in a bail application, e.g. hearsay evidence. Very true, Your Honor. So true. why should we then go to the variances in Pillay's affidavit and Harrison's uh, 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 affidavit? Because that is for the trial court. Should, why should we not confine ourselves in, whether or in the purpose for which these two affidavits are meant for? Harrison makes the affidavit to the Eswatini court for the Eswatini court to say there is prima facie evidence against these people you are appearing before you, arrest them. So is the affidavit by Pillay. There is prima facie evidence against these people. And Pillay has to go a step further and say that they are risk if they are granted pay. They may not stand trial. They are a flight risk, etc., 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 etc. Am, am I following correctly? Your Worship, the, the court has its finger firmly on the pulse. Your Worship, it, it, that is exactly what a, an attempt is made to do in paragraph 28 that the SCA has held that in Matebula to 2010, volume 1, SACR 55, that the accused must, on a balance of probabilities, prove that the state case is non existent or subject to doubt. It was in an eloquent and conscious effort to discharge that, to demonstrate to this court that, as far as the Africans understand, if one were to show the doubt, among other things, let's look at the time. Let's look how the Inspector Pillay explains the evidence. Whether the court agrees or not, it's a different ball game altogether. But at the end of the day, when based on our dear Dr. Rambar when given an opportunity, in terms of the, of the, of the, of the legislature, to present evidence why exceptional circumstances exist, among other things, then that is present. And it's not the only aspect of worship. That is why in the answer, in the replying affidavit, it was stated that, hence the grounds were not proffered up front. They had to place reliance on Skitika just to give broad, uh, broad uh, 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 information why they are of the view that exceptional circumstances exist, which in the interest of, uh, interest of justice or under release of bail. Another aspect that uh, I, I, I wanted to question, you are saying the state did not advance the grounds of opposing bail, and you cite Mr. Lamini, uh, yet there is no affidavit by Mr. Lamini to say that uh, uh, that is indeed the fact. Correct? Yes, there was no need for the affidavit. But there is no affidavit. Th there is no need because it's, 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 a, it's a submission that is part of this court record. Mm -hmm. It's common cause between the parties. Throughout, twice or thrice, the state was called upon to show reasons. The state saying, wait. <laughs> in the modern era that we live in, in courts where this court is overburdened with bail applications and so on and so forth, at a pragmatic level, would not be an appropriate thing to do to say, one, two, three, those are the reasons. Then as the bail proceeds, we are able to facilitate things. Mm, okay, let's, let's, let's proceed. Yes. Your Worship, that is, that is, that is, those are all my submissions as I've already indicated that the, the, the heads of argument are before this honorable court, unless the court were to require me to clarify any of the, of the, of the, of my submissions. I think I've engaged you as we are proceeding. Uh, uh, forgive me for interrupting your train of thoughts, uh, but I had to raise the questions as they emerged. Your Worship, I came and to this court well knowing I don't have luxury of leaving things unexplained. <laughs> I understand that fully. <laughs> Thank you. So that is applicant one and uh, Oh, maybe maybe before you sit down, Mr. 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 <coughs> Mr. Mdoja, there is this one question that uh, I, I, I need to 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 to, un to ask, and I'm asking it now. So, in respect of applicant number one, what are your submissions? What is exceptional about applicant number one? Another question comes to my mind right now. 
uh, which I'm, I'm going to ask after this one. Yes, <laughs> In paragraph 9, that is exactly what I was trying to capture, that though it was easy to enact, axiomatic and inelectable from the judicial analysis of the Sarapian Bail jurisprudence is that the phrase itself, exceptional circumstances, is by no means easy to explain. It is again that's, that background that I make reference to the State versus Jonas case and the number of cases that uh, exceptional circumstances is not defined there can be as many circumstances as the term in essence implies. Mm. The Constitutional Court in State versus Lamini and others stated that in the final analysis, the evaluation is to do judicially, which means that one looks at the substance rather than the form. So it's against that background issue that I've cited quite a number of cases in an effort to help that you should be in the world of law, there is a great deal of unanimity that uh, it causes headache to, 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 to most of the lawyers in the world of law, the, the exact definition. It, 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 it is on, on, against that background that I'm asking, because what is exceptional in respect of applicant number one may not necessarily be exceptional in respect of applicant number three or four or five. That's why my question to you is, what is your submission what is exceptional in respect of applicant number one? Let's confine ourselves at this point in time only in, uh, on applicant number one. We'll get to applicant number five that you are representing as well. As the court pleases, the court may bear with me. Your Worship, though it has been put succinctly, I think the court will find the answer to the court's question in paragraph seven and eight. In paragraph seven, seven eight, okay. paragraph seven and eight of my heads of argument. In paragraph seven, I submit it is accordingly, accordingly humbly submitted that the applicant's main contention is that they have succeeded in discharging the honours resting on them to show and satisfy this honourable court that exceptional circumstances exist, which, in the interest of justice, permit their release on bail. In paragraph eight, their personal circumstances. Your Worship, I was trying to be short, without citing all the personal circumstances they've given in their founding affidavits, the reasons they have proffered for release on bail, all those reasons are in the affidavit worship. In the footnote, I make reference to that. Yes, they are undertaking to comply with any term and condition in terms of Section 62 of the Criminal Procedure Act, make out unequivocally a case that the applicants ought to be admitted to bail. So that, that is your answer to my question. I apologize, the long answer to a short question. Thank you. Uh, another, another thing that pertains to applicant number, four, number one, which I say is the question that comes to my mind, which had slipped my mind, but because of the questions I've raised, it comes to my mind again. Yes, please. There is a dent or allegations that were made against uh, applicant number one, and there is an affidavit to that effect by Dr. Moodley, to say the wife of applicant number one was on his or was in his uh, uh, rooms, I think on the 11th of March, and he was, she was with the applicant number one, who presented to Dr. Moodley that uh, he was an employee at Fosco, and. Fosco is known to all of us who are coming from that area that uh, is full of dust and he's suffering from uh, sinus and things. In other words, the person of applicant number one was in the rooms of Dr. Naid, of Dr. Moodley, according to his affidavit. And if you look at the list of patients that were in attendance in Dr. Moodley's rooms on the date in question, the name of applicant number one appears. Now, what is that? <laughs> Your Worship, uh, I understand that that is what my learned colleagues for the state are also raising in paragraph 57. Applicant 1 alleges that he has... I did not read there. I did not have time to read it. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'm raising these questions from what I've read. Your I Worship, did not have the opportunity of reading the state's uh, hate. As the court pleases. Your Worship, the, the state in paragraph 57 says, Applicant 1 alleges that he has a chronic asthmatic, asthmatic health condition. It is important we submit to note that in this regard, applicant once submitted in court a doctor's note from a Dr. Motley. The state followed up this information and obtained an affidavit from Dr. Motley. 
reference is made to KP8 to exhibit G. As per KP8, it is clear we submit that applicant one handed false evidence in court during these proceedings. This we submit is one aspect that this honorable court should consider. Uh, Your Worship, um, my, 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 my submission is uh, the state has made reference to the case of State versus Yanda from the, I think it's from the Eastern Cape. I see there again that a medical certificate from a traditional healer was, was handed up. What distinguishes it from this case is that the learned magistrate and the parties agreed that the matter be postponed for the state to follow up. It turned out he did not consult with the traditional heel. But Your Worship, with regard to accused number one, uh, in his replying affidavit, and it cannot be disputed, he is currently receiving chronic medication for, for his asthma. In his replying affidavit, he says he is receiving a pump. So Your Worship had the state confirmed with the health division of Westville Prison. That information would have been, would have been confirmed. I'm inclined to accept that uh, applicant number one is asthmatic and uh, he is receiving treatment for that. I don't have issues with that. I want to accept that. But what I'm questioning is the conduct. When he is in Westville prison, he is appearing before Dr. Moodley. His name appears on the list of patients that were to be seen by Dr. Moodley. Before Dr. Moodley, he is pointed out, that is Mr. Mkwanazi. And his name appears on the list. Now my question to you is, what is that? Your Worship, my respectful submission to that will be, two, one, uh, probably miscommunication between the accused and the wife because according to Mr. Pillay, it would appear that the person who was there was a pregnant wife. My, my, my instructions were, when he wanted to continue with treatment at Westville Hospital, they wanted a note from the, from the doctor. That's the instruction that I was given. To exit the point, worship, my humble submission will be, this court is a creature of statute. It can't do anything unless the law says it can. In other words, this court can make a credibility finding against applicant number one as that responsibility rests fully on the trial court as, as this court has earlier on indicated. But this information that applicant number one, when he was at Westville Prison, appeared before uh, Dr. Moodley, what is it? You should Because, because that, that is the impression created uh, by the papers, and that is the impression which was given to Dr. Moodley. Dr. Moodley has since filed an affidavit to that effect, and he is referring to a person in front of him who was referred to as Lindo, Lindo, Lindo Gutle, but Mr. Mkwanaz. As God pleases. Yoshi, in the light of the fact that neither the state nor the court in terms of section 60 subsection 3 ordered that the medical records from Westville be brought to court in the light of the fact that in the replying affidavit applicant number one takes this court into full confidence saying my legal team has attempted to procure this the medical records from Westville to present them in court however Westville hospital says without the order of the court they can't release those medical records. Therefore, the fact still remains, which is the subject matter of the submission, that applicant number one is a chronic asthmatic uh, patient receiving medication at, at Westville Prison. Mr. Lord, you, are, you, are not, you are not the witness. You are not an accused person. Uh, so it would be unfair to subject you to cross-questioning and I don't intend doing that, I, and, I I'm not, and I'm not doing that. I, I fully understand, Your Worship, I fully but understand. But the question still remains, was it not misrepresentation that was made to Dr. Moodley? 
that the person is Lindogushem Kwanas. Whereas in truth and in fact, it's not. When, whereas in truth and in fact, that person was not Mr. Mkwanazi because at that point in time, Mr. Mkwanazi was in Westville prison. Your Worship, I fully, as an officer of the court, I fully concede that on, that, on that aspect, uh, 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 Your Worship, except that the only submission will be, because at the end of the court, this honorable court will have to make a finding, is he a chronic asthmatic patient? In the absence of the evidence from the state, and his declaration is his replying affidavit, that whoever challenges that I'm receiving uh, asthmatic medication from Westley, if the order is obtained based on the order of the court, that information can be presented. So that information still, that fact still remains, Your Worship. Thank you. I am indebted to the court, Your Worship. <coughs> Your Worship, one aspect, uh, my apologies, one aspect being brought to my attention by my instructing attorney Lamini is accused number five voluntarily handing himself, himself over. Yes, that, yes. that demeanor is not a demeanor of a person who is, who is a flight risk. After the call through the murder, mother had been received, he did a legal thing under the circumstances to get a lawyer and the lawyer handed himself over. To the to the to the police, Miss Gilling, uh, uh, Miss Gilling, who is who is in court. So the issue of flight risk, your worship, there is no objective, dependable evidence the state presented to substantiate that allegation. And your submission, what is exceptional about him? In the court within the which that he presented himself, your worship, in the court within which this honourable court will be cooking that decision, whether or not exceptional circumstances exist. Among other things, this honorable court to also consider the voluntary handing over to the police by the, the applicant. Thank you. Ask court, please. <coughs> that concludes. Call back of one and number five, your worship. Number two, are you in a position to argue now, Mr. Volmerans, or should we take a short break? My very friend is whispering to me that we should take a short break. But I'm ready. Did, when, he, when did, 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 on, did, did he whisper to say how long? You wish. You must take instructions. <laughs> <laughs> you wish we were in your hands. I forgot my letter. Uh, can, can, can we resume at 12 o'clock? Please. Please, let's, let's resume at 12 o'clock.